All right, welcome everyone to our a new installment of our Quantum Matters Seminar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you uh, back with us today. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Martin uh, Morigal uh, from, Cal uh, from Georgia Tech, who's going to be talking about uh, recent neutron scattering experiments on conventional magnets and uh, some unusual excitation spectra. All thank right. you, Martin, for being with us today. Uh, please go ahead. All right, thank you. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Christia. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and uh, be able to talk to you today. So uh, my group uh, at Georgia Tech was established in 2015, so that's all the group members that we had since 2015. Uh, and uh, I was lucky to uh, get a lot of support from the university when I came here, and uh, uh, which allowed us to get you know, federal support for our research and uh, what we do relies a lot on large scale facilities and we are quite close to Oak Ridge National Lab. It's a short drive, it's three hours uh, from the lab. So we do a lot of things with them. And most of what I'm going to show today is actually uh, measurements that we have done rather in the lab here or performed at uh, uh, the Scalation Neutron Source at Oak Ridge. And in particular, the work is the PhD thesis of Zhao Zhang Bai, uh, who is now at Oak Ridge and two postdocs, uh, Joe Patterson and Zilin Dun. Um, and this uh, subset of the work I'm going to show today was uh, supported by DOE. Uh, but before I, I, I go in the meat of the talk, I'd like to advertise if, if it's allowed by the rules of this seminar, I'd like to uh, highlight that in spite of the pandemic, we have a faculty search in my department. And in fact, we are looking for a chair. Uh, so if you know anybody uh, or if you're interested yourself in a, a you know, research and leadership position here at Georgia Tech, uh, uh, the ad is on physics today, or you can contact me. I'm actually on the search committee. Uh, so I'd be delighted to hear, you know, comments from other colleagues that uh, have some interest in applying. Uh, so please uh, let me know if you, if you know anyone uh, that uh, I could solicitate or if you're interested yourself uh, into this. Uh, after this uh, uh, a small advertisement, let me give you the outline uh, today uh, because uh, I'm not uh, completely sure of the community. Uh, I, We'll try to give a relatively broad, broad introduction, and in particular, discuss a little bit uh, the key advances in the technique of neutron scattering that we are using extensively. Uh, and uh, then I will talk about two projects, one on, on quadrupolar fluctuations in uh, FEI2. Uh, sorry for this uh, little bug here. Uh, so, so that will be the, the main part of the talk, these quadrupolar fluctuations. And if I have time, I will talk about the classical spin liquid physics in magnesium chromite. Uh, so let me get started and, and frame a bit the problem and what, what we're working on in my lab. Uh, and, and mostly we, 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 we work on insulators and, and MOT insulators that are uh, completely uh, insulating but have interesting magnetic properties. And at the center of all these materials, as you know, is the, some form of Heisenberg and Newtonian uh, in one way or another. And, uh, you know, really from the materials point of view, the Heisenberg and Newtonian has two handles. One of them is the lattice. Uh, and the other one is, is spin space or anisotropies or, or absence of anisotropies. Uh, so we really see magnetic systems as, as lattice problems with spins. Uh, and of course, materials offers a great diversity of, uh, of systems. So we can work with frustrated lattices. We can work with non-frustrated lattices. Um, uh, spin space can also be uh, uh, tailored to different types of properties. We can work with spin half systems. Uh, we can work with classical spins, uh, so the local degrees of freedom can be controlled through the materials, and we can also work with systems that are intermediate, or at least that have a local Hilbert space that is not necessarily uh, SU2 and can be a bit larger, SU3, or we can have, for instance, nuclear degrees of freedom, we can have crystal field excitations or crystal field levels. So materials offer, on the one hand, the handle of the lattice, and on the other hand, the, the handle of spin space. And at least in the first project uh, that I'm going to present, uh, obviously there is a coupling between these two spaces uh, through spin orbit interaction, and that uh, again enables uh, new new properties in new physics. Uh, and for the second project, uh, we'll work with Heisenberg spins, which uh, you know are, are decoupled in, in in some sense from the lattice. Uh, but but really, you know, multi insulators, and and in the last twenty or, or, or fifteen years, uh, people have. I've really looked into these materials in details with a purpose, and this purpose is to find uh, entangled state of matter uh, directly in, in, a, in, a, in a material. Um, so, so our goal is to look at uh, magnetic materials to find 
magnetic phases that are clean and understand their excitations. And, and of course, uh, there is a plethora of different type of excitations we, we can expect uh, from the excitations that would emerge in a classical paramagnet. I, I'm not sure you can see my, my pointer, but I hope you can. Uh, from you know, excitations of a classical paramagnet to uh, ordered systems, or perhaps ordered systems with, with quantum fluctuations, all the way to systems that have uh, some degree of, of local or long range entanglement, uh, such as quantum paramagnets, valence bond solids, valence bond glasses, all the way to quantum scale liquids if, if they exist, uh, which I think they do, but, but we still need to go and find it. Uh, and one of the key thrusts in my lab is to use magnetic excitations. Uh, as really revealing uh, the quantum properties of the systems. And as we will see today, sometimes uh, going into systems which, in spite of having what looks like a classically ordered state, are in fact quantum in their excitation spectrum and display, display excitations that we could not explain otherwise, uh, meaning we, we need to use uh, quantum mechanical description of their, of their uh, excitations. Um, and one thing I want to point out right away is that, of course, when we deal with real materials, we have to deal with uh, a disorder and heterogeneities. And I think it's been realized now that, that this uh, materials phenomena are, are essential and, and they are there all the time. Sometimes uh, materials are worse than others. But, but from an experimental point of view, uh, we have to remember that all materials have disorder and, and they have potential to uh, show uh, physics that that uh, is induced by this disorder. And sometimes this physics is rich and, and unexpected, and, and that's also interesting. It's, it's not only an annoyance, it can actually be used to, uh, to induce new phases. So anyway, that's the landscape of, of what magnetic insulators can do. And, and, and uh, you know, if, if uh, you're trying to convince uh, someone to give you a, a lot of money to uh, find something, you would probably attack the problem from the quantum spin liquid point of view. But it turns out that uh, you know this uh, this intermediate states uh, intermediate quantum states are also interesting. So okay, so people are looking for quantum spin liquids in real in real systems. Uh, so massively entangled states of matter with uh, exotic excitations, and the question is where to find it. And so from an experimental point of view, uh, we uh, at least in the last five years we've been lucky that there are at least three or four Hamiltonians that we know for sure host a quantum spin liquid. Uh, one of them is that if we realize, realize it in a material in its native form, is the Kitaya honeycomb system, which uh, is potentially realized in ruthenium trichloride. Uh, there is, of course, the Heisenberg Kagome system that is uh, likely realized in Herbert Smith side. And there are all the uh, related Hamiltonians that uh, we know for sure have some degree of, of, uh, of ground state entanglement. And if you are lucky, you find such a material, you measure it, and, and, uh, and you're done. Uh, but in practice, uh, you know, in the phase space of materials, we, 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 are not, uh, we are not so lucky that the first thing we grow is, is uh, directly the most exotic states of, of matter that we can imagine, at least from the magnetic point of view. And so uh, we usually end up with a rather classically behaved system or system that falls into two types of broad categories, uh, which, which are relevant for quantum spin liquid. And one of them is, is one-dimensional or, or quasi-one-dimensional system. And, and from my point of view, uh, this 1D systems are, are beautiful and very rich and, and still have, offer a lot of promise uh, in order to understand the details of quantum mechanics uh, in solids. And here, this is an example of a, a system that shows the signature of, of one-dimensional excitation, which is spin-ons, but it shows that in, a, in the context of a metallic system, uh, which is quite interesting. This is the work from uh, Lizzie Owu and uh, uh, Megan Aronson's and Igor Zalizniak's. Uh, groups. So uh, if you cannot find a 2D or 3D quantum spin liquid, 1D physics is, is, is an attractive area to, to do quantum mechanics uh, and many body quantum mechanics, in my opinion. And, 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 and the key thing is that we expect uh, uh, in the system excitations that have some sort of continuum uh, and all a sort of transport that, that is the signature of their fractionalization. But um, on the other hand, uh, a lot of materials are rather ordered or if they are uh, liquid-like at low temperature, maybe these liquids can be understood, understood classically. And a key example of this is what uh, people call spin ice, uh, which is a frustrated system with ice in spins. And uh, uh, although there might be some signatures of, of quantum effects in the system, they, are, they can be understood classically. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, in spite of being liquids, uh, the, the, 
the, the response is, is classical. And uh, one, one signature of this is that their, their correlations uh, uh, in real space are usually uh, continuous or in momentum space are continuous, sorry. And so that gives us uh, the type of state from, from perhaps from which we can start with. So, uh, you know, it's tough to find quantum spin liquids and uh, it's not the whole story because uh, if you uh, find classical ground state with exotic excitations, there is actually a lot you can do and there are maybe more materials you can work with. And that's what uh, I want to, to show today is looking at materials that we know for a long time, but deploying, uh, you know, new or relatively new neutron scattering techniques and a lot of analysis, we can really extract uh, important and useful um, information. So uh, I need to introduce the technique of neutron scattering a little bit. I don't want to spend too much time uh, on this. Uh, the, the, the key feature of neutrons, of course, is that they carry a spin and through the spin, uh, they can interact with the magnetic moments in the sample. And uh, this uh, scattering process is essentially a conservation of momentum, energy, and spin. Um, and uh, we design instruments that uh, have a better way or another to capture uh, this kind of uh, uh, conservation loss. And of course, the beauty of the technique, uh, and, and, and in some sense, what we are using a lot in, in the project that we'll show, is the ability to connect with theory because the cross section, uh, what we measure in the detector, is directly related up to geometrical factors and something that have to do with the form factor, the, the orbital in which the magnetic moments are, are living. Uh, but up to this materials and geometrical constants or, or, or parameters, if you wish, the, uh, the, the technique directly measures the dynamic structure factor. And, and that quantity, uh, you can understand it in several ways, but a, a simple way to understand it is that it's a Fourier transform in time and space of two point correlators between spins. Um, and, and from the point of view of theory, this is something that, that is straightforward or relatively straightforward to calculate. And so this uh, allows a direct coupling between the technique of neutron scattering and, and, and perhaps the latest advance of, of theory uh, without much ambiguity. So sometimes um, these dynamic correlations are difficult to analyze because in principle, it's a four dimensional uh, object, which has three dimensions of Q and one dimension of energy. So in my talk, uh, uh, when I, when, I, when we start looking at materials, sometimes we integrate over energy and we calculate the instantaneous structure factor, uh, which is a reflection of instantaneous correlations in the system. So that quantity is a three-dimensional object, which sometimes is easier to analyze when, when we start on, on the new materials. So in my talk, I will present plots, which are essentially plots of the dynamic, dynamic structure factor or the instantaneous structure factor, S of Q. Um, and, and just a quick word that the techniques we, we use to do neutron scattering have evolved over time uh, and the venerable triple axis spectrometer, which was uh, the way that inelastic scattering was discovered, uh, you essentially measure your reciprocal space point by point by moving uh, uh, crystal analyzers or crystal monochromator in reciprocal and, and the sample uh, uh, and, and, and uh, exploring reciprocal space like this. So this is a point by point detection technique that may not be uh, as efficient to, to map broad spectra or continuum spec continuous spectra. So in, in the last 10 years, although this, this exists for a long time, in the last 10 years, the technique of time of flight spectroscopy has really uh, blossomed and, and this is now the main technique we actually use to explore new materials. And the advantage of this technique is that uh, instead of having one detector, we have millions of, uh, we don't have millions of detectors, but we have millions of pixels that surround our, our, our materials. And uh, this allows to massively parallelize the detection of the neutrons that are scattered from the sample. So the idea here, is that every neutron that has scattered from the sample has to be detected because it contains information about the sample. So uh, uh, neutron sources across the world have built these gigantic arrays of detectors in order to capture uh, these scattered neutrons. Of course, now you need to analyze the energy and so you're using the time of flight technique, which means that there is a lot of dead time between uh, pulses, but uh, uh, all in all, this is a, a very efficient technique to detect the sort of excitations we are interested in quantum magnetism at the moment. Um, and there are efforts to, and a successful is instruments that already exist where we, we can essentially multiplex the triple axis. And again, with this idea to detect as many scattered neutrons as possible. So this technology exists and we're using it extensively. And this is the type of results that I'm, I'm going to present now um, next. 
And before I do this, I just want to uh, give a, a brief snapshot of what we should expect in a, in a quantum magnet. Uh, and this is uh, 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 almost cartoonish at this point, although it's some real data. But uh, this is some work uh, uh, with uh, Henri Prono and uh, Meshkel Dandele in France when I uh, was a graduate student, uh, where we looked at the magnetic excitations in this uh, salt of copper sulfate, which forms one dimensional chains. And um, what's beautiful about that material is that with a very small magnetic field, we can tweak the ground state. So when we are in zero field, the system is, uh, is a true one dimensional spin chain of spin halves, so that the ground state should be entangled. Uh, a microscopic singlet, and when we excite that uh, ground state, we should uh, we should be spin, but we uh, fractionalize this excitation into spin-offs, uh, which come in pairs of twos, four, six, etc. And and this is this fractionalization of the excitation that gives rise to continuous uh, spectrum in, in neutron scattering experiments. And here, this is exactly what you see. Um, this is an example where, if you see that one given momentum transfer along the chain. Uh, there are several energies that fulfill the scattering condition, and you see the plot here. So this is energy versus momentum transfer. The plot, uh, the color of the plot is the intensity of the scattering or the dynamical structure factor. And uh, what you see is a continuum that emerges uh, at, at zero field in this material. So this is what we expect from fractional excitations in a quantum entangled state. What's beautiful is that we can apply a small magnetic field. Here we are applying five Tesla. And when we apply five Tesla, the spins align with the field. And excitations are just eigenstates of, of that Hamiltonian, just, just spin waves or magnets here, and, uh, and they have a sharp spectrum. And you see indeed that in the, in the experiment, when we apply a small magnetic field of five Tesla, uh, this broad continuum becomes uh, sharp, sharp modes. Uh, there are two modes here because there's two atoms in the unit cell. One of them is uncoupled from the rest. This is a technicality of the material. But this is really the, the, the picture here is that you know, an entangled state should have uh, fractional excitations, which show up as a continuum, and, and a classical state should have sharp excitations, spin waves, which are against eigenstates of the uh, of the problem after after Fourier transform. So, so that's the broadly painted picture, and and now let's try to see that in fact things can be more complicated and rich, and uh, in 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 systems in higher dimensions. So let me start with uh, FEA two, um, which is a project uh, as I said that was. Um, uh, done during the PhD thesis of Zhao Zhenbai, and he actually proposed to look at this material, and, and this was a quite successful uh, project, which we are still uh, continuing to, to this day. Uh, so this work uh, was done in particular uh, with Zilling Dun, who uh, grew the crystals and uh, aligned the crystals for these measurements, and the group of Chris and Batista, in particular Shang Shen Zhang, who did amazing work developing a, a Schunger boson theory to understand uh, this data. Okay. So uh, I need to rewind a little bit. And uh, so, so the goal of this project is to try to explore the idea of quadrupole fluctuations in, in, a, in a spin system. And so uh, multipolar spin states or multipolar states are, are, are expected in, in quantum magnetism simply because if you have an anisotropic magnetization distribution, you expect this distribution to decompose into dipole and, and quadrupole and octopolar moment. Um, and, and in some sense, uh, this quadrupolar or octopolar uh, systems uh, have a local order parameter, so they are not exotic in the sense of a quantum spin liquid. But uh, because the symmetry breaking is only partial, uh, there is still some interesting physics that that one can explore. And uh, and and uh, you know, th this is uh, in in one way one way to approach the, the spin liquid is to in to study this again these intermediate states uh, that have only partially broken symmetries. So the question is, where do you, where do you see such uh, multipolar uh, phases in, in, in quantum magnets? And it turns out there's many opportunities for this. Um, because what you want is a dipolar uh, order parameter to be zero and a quadrupolar order parameter to be non-zero. So there are several ways you can do this uh, that are known for a long time. For instance, if you have a F, uh, F, F electron system, uh, uh, you can have crystal field uh, environment that, that naturally uh, generate uh, crystal field multipoles. Uh, one example is neptunium oxide or some other, uh, you know, uh, heavy fermion type materials uh, have, have such properties where, where the multipoles are preformed at the single ion level uh, because of the crystal field environment. Uh, you have other systems, for instance, iron selenides or nicknites and, and uh, strontium iridate, where, where uh, 
the pneumatic or polypolar sector is, is electronic, so there is a Fermi surface property that lends itself to, to pneumaticity. Um, and closer to quantum magnetism, in fact, uh, you can simply imagine creating quadrupoles by pairing two spins out. This is a really natural way of think, thinking about it. It's, it's the way the spin one is constructed in some sense. Uh, and and for, for instance, you could imagine creating these bond pneumatic states. Uh, one example or proposed example is lithium copper vanadate. So we have a chain of spin halves. The, the spins are interacting uh, ferromagnetically with nearest neighbors and anti-ferromagnetically between next nearest neighbors. And that tends to create quadrupoles. And, and the question is if we can observe such, uh, such bond pneumatic states. And, and spin one systems have been proposed for a long time and, and studied for their, their propensity to uh, to develop multipolar order because uh, by quadratic exchange in particular is is uh, is a possibility to uh, to to stabilize such particles. Um, but the challenge really is is perhaps although it's difficult to see this uh, uh, multipolar order, the challenge really is about the fluctuations. Can we capture and see multipolar fluctuations? Okay, can we see the fluctuations of these degrees of freedom? Uh, and if you think naively about it, you would say that this is hidden to neutrons because this carries a, a delta z s equal to uh, quantum number, so we should not be able to see it with neutrons, and, and that's true. Now, there are other spectroscopy techniques, such as Raman scattering or inelastic X-ray scattering, that may be able to see directly such fluctuations. But there is a trick you can use, and that's what I'm going to show. You can hybridize these quadrupolar fluctuations with all the degrees of freedom to which you have access. And one famous example is actually uranium oxide, in which these quadrupolar moments that are preformed hybridize with the phonons, and and give and and, and through this, uh, uh, this quadrupolar fluctuations are revealed. And in FEA two, what I want to show you is that this is actually a coupling to the one magnon sector that reveals the quadrupolar fluctuations in the material. So that's what I want to uh, do now, and I'm going to start with a simple toy model, uh, uh, and that captures most of the physics, in fact. And this is that of a spin one chain with an easy axis uh, anisotropy. Um, so if you work with spin ones, uh, naturally you can represent the local Hansite Hilbert space with, with three states, plus one, zero, and minus one. Uh, and the algebra that describes this can be generated by the traditional uh, Pauli matrices, say, or, or dipolar operators. But you also have quadrupolar operators that, uh, that participate in this, in this local uh, Hilbert space. Uh, so, so, so that's one thing on the one hand. And now what we can do is we can put the spin once on, on a lattice and, and the lattice I'm talking about is just the ferromagnetic uh, spin one chain uh, with uh, ferromagnetic interactions and, and easy access anisotropy in the limit where the anisotropy is strong, okay, where the, the anisotropy dominates the exchange. And this is, this is very simple. You just have a ferromagnetic state like this. Uh, dipole moment is, is non-zero. And of course, quadrupolar moment is non-zero, but it's, uh, it's just a secondary order parameter for this. So now let's look at the excitations. Again, this is quite cartoonish and, and, and relatively simple, but it captures, in fact, what we see in this, uh, in this system. So when you excite the system, you can create a magnon, which is just flipping one spin from, from plus one to zero. And you can create two magnons, and there are several flavors of them. You can create two free magnons, so they are un 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 unattached uh, one magnon excitations. Um, and you can also create bond states. So they are bond states because if you compare the energy, say, of a, a, a two magnon with the energy of a two magnon bond states, where the two one magnons are on neighboring sides, you see that this uh, uh, this excitation has gained an energy of, of the of the order of the exchange j compared to the, the free magnons here. Um, and so uh, you can do this even more. You can excite the same side twice, uh, which corresponds to quadrupolar fluctuation because it's a delta is equal to excitation, of course, and that. Uh, that excitation has a stabilization energy that is of the order of twice the, uh, uh, the single ion anisotropy. And so, so this is a bond state of, the, of two magnons. Okay? Um, and, and it's possible if, if uh, the anisotropy D and the exchange J are, are of right sizes, it's possible for this uh, to be actually the lowest excitation in the system. Okay? The, the one magnon excitation would believe higher than, than the two magnon excitation. So what do we expect from such system? In fact, people looked at this a lot in the late 1970s. And what you expect is that if you have only a, a single ion on anisotropy, uh, the plus one and the minus one states are degenerate, and your, your zero state is, is uh, elevated by an energy D. 
But now, when uh, there is exchange interactions, what you expect is that uh, perhaps the vice field that is experienced by the minus one side will lift its energy, and perhaps it will be, as a function of momentum, some place where this uh, uh, traditional magnon excitation and this quadrupolar fluctuation, perhaps it will be a place where these excitations have the same energy. Okay? Uh, but irrespective of uh, the fact that they cross or not, you should not be able to see these quadrupolar modes here because they are still delta is equal to excitation. So they should be invisible to dipolar probes such as neutron scattering. So let me show you how we actually see them in FEA2. And, and I think that's, the, that's what we uh, you know, managed to understand in this problem. So, so materials have their own specifics and, and we need to understand detailed Hamiltonians of the materials in order to progress. So sometimes it looks tedious, and it is tedious, and uh, I'd like to you know, shout out to the students that, that spend hours and days and weeks fitting Hamiltonians with 15 parameters in order to understand the Hamiltonian of, of, of these materials. But when we do so, we are able to fully explain uh, what we see in, in scattering, and, and, and I think that that brings a lot of, of value. So this, this material FEA2 can be understood from two point of view. The single ion physics uh, is, is is well known and, and well understood and documented in quite some details. Uh, you end up with uh, three levels below uh, an energy of, of say 10 millivolt and uh, uh, you have a spin one. Uh, you can map this low energy Hamiltonian into a spin one system with uh, a single ion and isotropy. And the first uh, excited state here is at around two millivolts. So we work with uh, this sub, uh, subspace of the, of the crystal field Hamiltonian or, or spin orbit coupled uh, 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 states and 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 this uh, ions are on a lattice and it turns out that uh, the lattice in FEA2 is simple it's a triangular lattice of iron coordinated with iodine but uh, exchange interactions actually uh, are relatively complicated in the plane of the of the triangular we need j1 j2 and j3 to explain the physics and between the planes we need four different exchange interactions to explain uh, the magnetic structure so when this material is cooled down below 9 Kelvin, it, it orders magnetically. And the ordered state uh, as a relatively large unit cell, we, we call this propagation vector, it's one quarter, zero, one quarter. So it means the unit cell is quadrupole along the A direction, quadrupole along the C direction. And so the, the magnetic structure looks like stripes. You see uh, along, say, the B axis, there are stripes uh, with two spins up, two spins up, uh, two spin down, two spin up, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really J3 that is actually doing this kind of, stabilizing this kind of ground state. Um, so, you know, it's an ordered magnetic state and, and it does not seem to be much reduction of the ordered moment. So you could, you could think that uh, that's it. It's, it's a boring ordered magnet. Um, but uh, people in the 1980s did a lot of spectroscopy on the systems because they are relatively easy to grow as single crystals. Um, and here, this is an example of far infrared spectroscopy. And what they find is uh, a certain number of resonances, in fact, three resonances at low energy. And when they apply the magnetic field, they find two resonances lines that split as the one magnons with the G tensor of three, uh, 3.2, which is what you expect here for iron two plus in this environment. But they also find a resonance that splits with a double G factor. And, and, and because of this, uh, this excitation was assigned the name of two magnon or single ion bond state. Okay, so uh, that already tells you that that the physics I discussed in the toy model is actually active in the system. Um, and, and this is how it was first identified in the, in the 1980s. So fast forward to 2019 and 2020 when we did this work, uh, the first thing we wanted to do is to qualitatively understand this exchange interactions. And one of the techniques we use now is we take these magnets and we put them very close above their ordering temperature. And we look at the spin correlations in the paramagnetic regime, just above the ordering temperature. And uh, it's, it's a liquid, uh, so it's a highly correlated uh, spin uh, system. And, and this correlations actually can be uh, used to reveal uh, at least uh, the orders of magnitude and, and the different signs of the exchange interactions. So that's what we do. We, we put our crystals on these on this spectrometers and we, we, we collect the entire structure factor, S of Q, three-dimensional function, and we analyze it. And we can extract the exchange interactions with it. So the way we analyze it, I don't want to go into details. It's, it's uh, the, a very efficient way. It's called the self-consistent Gaussian approximation. It's essentially a, a, a soft spin approximation uh, for the partition function. And this allows us to, uh, to, to understand this data. So you see here, uh, this is uh, uh, two directions in momentum space, 
uh, in the triangular plane. This is the data. You see that the color indicates correlations between spins. And we are able to fit this data uh, in, in, in all its details almost. And, and uh, from this fits, we can extract exchange interactions, okay? J1, J2, J3, and the different exchange interactions between the planes. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Um, why is it uh, important to be just above the transition temperature? So, so it's not, so, so maybe I insisted too much on this. So, so uh, actually you have to be careful. So you have to be in a regime where they are well-formed correlations. So you have something to fit, okay? That there are some structures that are information rich in your data. Now, uh, if you are too close to the ordering temperature, this approximation, this SCGA approximation may break down. And in fact, uh, you, you may actually be fitting uh, an incorrect theory. So you have to find a regime where, where this works. A uh, high, high, high degree of correlation between spins, but still a good description in terms of the subspin approximation. So what we do, we actually compare this with classical Monte Carlo simulations to check that, uh, which contain more effects, right? Uh, the full uh, classical Monte Carlo contains more effect than this SCGA. And we look uh, that we, we make sure that the two agree and, and in that regime we are fine. So we go to the lowest temperature to which these two techniques agree in, in some sense. Okay, okay so, so you're trying to find kind of a sweet spot, like a compromise. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that that would be a good way to say. It. So if you go too low, too close to the transition, you might be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay, point. thank you. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, long story short, we can grow uh, some of these crystals in, in, in uh, very large chunks and, and they are air sensitive, so we need to handle them correctly. But when we uh, handle them correctly and we put them on our spectrometers, what, what we find is an excitation pattern that looks like this. So uh, this is the data in FEA2 below the ordering transition. And here this is uh, certain directions in momentum space in the triangular plane and here this is the energy. And what you see is two bands of excitations, or perhaps, in fact, more bands here, but two broad bands of excitations. And this corresponds to the two magnon, and this corresponds to the one magnon that was previously discussed by the far infrared uh, folks in the 1980s. Okay? And you see here that having large crystals and having the resolution, energy resolution of this uh, time of flight machines allows us to see all the details in this complex excitation spectrum. In fact, this sample was measured in the 1980s with neutrons, with triple axis spectrometers, but they could not grasp all the details of these dispersion curves. And, and this will become important yeah, in a minute. So, you know, well, the first thing uh, we do now, nowadays is that we take our, our exchange interactions, we put it in a, in a code that calculates the spin waves, and we compare it with the data, and this is what we get, okay? Uh, so we use standard spin wave theory with the exchange interactions we extracted, extracted from paramagnetic regime and, and we find something like this. And you see that, of course, the, the, the overall bandwidth and the overall scale of this interaction is correct, but the details are, are completely wrong, okay? Uh, in particular, uh, you can see that, uh, um, you know, the, the, in, in fact, this two magnon uh, excitation is missing. Uh, there is no gap between these branches. Um, and, and if you are experienced with this, you realize that there are some details, for instance, in this box here, we see that the intensity at this point and the intensity at this point are different, although they are a similar point in the, in the brillium zone. So, so uh, for a bravid lattice, such as the triangular lattice, you should have the same intensity at all points of the, of the brillium zone, uh, uh, at least in, in, simple, in simple models. And so, so the fact that the intensity is modulated with different periodicity than, than the, the, the lattice periodicity, is, is, is a sign that there is something, something going on. So what we did here is to try to understand what, what is missing in our, in our spin and Melconian. And, and what is missing is exchange and isotropy, as, as simple as this. Um, and uh, so what we uh, had to do in order to explain the details of this data is extend our, our, our exchange interactions from being Heisenberg to uh, having um, all the symmetries, symmetry allowed terms on each each nearest neighbor ball. Okay, so for the triangular lattice, uh, the exchange interaction is actually a matrix, and that matrix has four terms that are uh, independent in the matrix. We can parameterize them in different ways, and, and this goes back to another material we looked at called uh, Ichever Magnus Gallium 04. And uh, I believe that Sasha Chernichev will be talking in the seminar series in a few weeks, and, and he's been uh, uh, pushing a complete understanding of, of the system. So I let, let him. Uh, if he talks about this, uh, that, that's a fascinating story. Uh, but anyway, in order to explain this data, we had to generalize to all the possible exchange interactions on each uh, nearest neighbor bonds. 
So I don't want to go too much into details. There are several ways to parameterize this. Uh, we call it J1 plus minus Z and plus minus plus minus. It's just a certain parameterization of the off-diagonal exchange interactions. Um, in fact, you could represent the same Hamiltonian with simply a JYZ interaction. And, um, and when you go from one bond of the lattice to the next bond of the lattice, you have to apply a rotation matrix, et cetera. So it turns out that this parameterization is easier because when we have several bonds uh, at different angles, we can generalize this Hamiltonian. But so that's some details uh, of the way we parameterize this. The message is just that we let all interactions be, be spin anisotropic on nearest neighbor interactions. And we let our interactions be uh, of the XXZ type on all other bonds of the system. And when we do so, uh, we uh, immediately do one thing is that we couple, you see that this uh, type of interaction does not conserve the spin quantum number. So we immediately couple the one magnon and the two magnon sector. And the spin wave theory cannot, cannot do this for you. You need to generalize it. And this is the amazing work that Christian and his group did, which is to generalize uh, the problem uh, using Schwinger bosons to, uh, to having dipolar and quadrupolar fluctuations on equal footing. Um, so essentially, you represent this plus one, zero, and minus one states with three types of bosons. So you constrain them uh, in the traditional Schwinger boson way, and, uh, and you, uh, you, you plug the Hamiltonian and you try to, to fit the data. And, and this is what we get. Okay, so this is after fitting and, and optimizing of these parameters. What we find is that we can explain. Uh, the data, not only in, in, uh, in broad terms, but also in the specifics, in particular, uh, intensity modulation between different zones, uh, the gap between the branches, et cetera, et cetera. So what does it mean? Okay, so, so what have we done here? Um, well, the physics I'm talking about is, is quite simple. Uh, in this system, we have two types of single particle excitation, one magnon and two magnon bond states, or single ion bond states. Uh, these are in principle two different sectors, but now because of anisotropic exchange interactions, these two sectors are coupled, and this JZ plus minus interaction maps into Schwinger bosons into a BI minus one dagger BI zero. So it's essentially uh, 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 creating a, a quadrupolar fluctuation from a one magnon state. And you can see here, this is a plot from Christian's group, where um, uh, if we don't have this off diagonal exchange interaction, you see our, our magnons. We have four branches because the unit cell has been uh, 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 four sublattices. Uh, and you see this one, uh, this two magnetic excitation here is the red line. It, it's just there. There's nothing. It's not visible. But when you couple it uh, through the off diagonal interaction, you see that everything uh, starts to resemble the data. Okay. Um, and so, long story short, here we can we can fit and and the students uh, did amazing work and the puzzle did amazing work to understand this. And, uh, and we realize, in fact, in the system, the off-diagonal interaction in this parameterization is the largest interaction in the system. Uh, it's not big, but it's, 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 a, it's a dominant interaction in the system. OK, so, so that's essentially the message here uh, that, that I want to convey about this material. I will, I will uh, move to the next one uh, swiftly. But uh, so the message is that we have a classically ordered system, uh, but in its excitation sector, things are non-trivial. Um, and what we see here is that uh, because of off-diagonal uh, exchange interactions, we can reveal quadrupolar fluctuations that are usually camouflaged. They are, they are a, a hidden sector of our excitation spectrum, but now they become revealed by the coupling uh, JX uh, or JYZ here that couples these two sectors. And you see essentially hybridization between these excitations. So it's, so it's, it's, it's in the end quite simple. Um, what uh, is also quite interesting is that we can quantitatively understand this. And here, this is an example where we cut the data at fixed energy. This is our data, and this is our uh, linear uh, uh, generalized spin wave theory, so Schwinger boson SG3 theory. And you see that the matching is, is, is essentially perfect. Okay, so we can generalize this these ideas to to SG3 spins, and uh, and what's quite nice, at least what what Christian tells me, is that. If you wanted to do this with SU2 spins, you would have to sum a lot of diagrams because you need to create this bond state perturbatively. You, you're summing one over, Earth's ter one over S terms in your Hamiltonian. But here, uh, this SU3 representation brings uh, on equal footing the, the, the quadrupolar and the dipolar sector, and you can simply couple them. And, and, and at the end of the day, it looks, it looks uh, almost a textbook example of an hybridization between two modes with different quantum numbers. But, but to get there, we had to, to develop and, and 
at all these techniques and also push the resolution of instruments and, and the crystals, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I will, I will uh, quickly go on the, the second uh, project. Uh, and and uh, I just want to say that uh, this is not, this is in fact just the beginning of the story because this material, what actually attracted our attention to this material in the beginning is that when you apply a magnetic field, there is a lot of different high field phases that are, uh, that are present in the material. And, and it's natural to imagine that these phases may actually originate from the condensation of these different quadrupolymers. It turns out that the story is a little bit more complicated, but what we are doing now is the full field study of this thing. So here you see a spectrum measured on the high spec spectrometer at, at Oak Ridge, where we apply a, a magnetic field of one Tesla and you see our branches are splitting. And um, when we elevate the magnetic field close to uh, what looks like a critical point here, uh, these excitations get really broad. And so this is one thing we are trying to understand at the moment. And, and the possibility here, or the message perhaps that is more important, is that in this material, we can have quadrupolar fluctuations really as the lowest energy sector. And when we bring these uh, uh, fluctuations down in, 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 uh, with the field, we can populate them thermally. And so we get essentially something that becomes broad because quadrupolar fluctuations are thermally populated while dipolar uh, excitations are not. So this brings us, uh, you know, that's, that's the plan for the future. And, and we are deep into this with Christine's group and, and uh, stay, stay, tuned, stay tuned about this. But, um, you know, I, I, I found this quite, quite interesting that, that in something that looks boring, there's actually some, it's not complicated, but some cute physics that, that we can see and we can understand in, in all the details. Um, you know, in fact, I, I, I don't know exactly what time it is, but I should probably not move to, to the next project. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have time for that. Uh, I, I will skip to, uh, to my conclusion. Um, and uh, then I have time for questions. I see that uh, Natasha turned our, our video on, so, so it means that- I wanted uh, to ask a question before the, you- the roasting, the roasting is coming. So I will, uh, I, I will, uh, I will uh, jump to my conclusions um, and uh, uh, just uh, very briefly mention a few things. So, so this is the, uh, back to the advertisement part of, uh, of all of this. So we are in the process, uh, we as the community of scatterers in the, in the US uh, to, and with Oak Ridge National Lab to, to advocate and, and go forward with the new neutron source that would be built at Oak Ridge National Lab. And that would be what we call a second target station. Uh, so essentially some of the, uh, of, the, of the protons that are used at the first target station, which is what I, I showed, the data I showed in this, in this presentation came from, from this neutron source. Uh, so uh, the idea is to have a new uh, uh, target building with, with neutrons that uh, would be generated at different frequency and with a different spectrum. Uh, and this would be cold neutrons that are ideal to study quantum materials and in particular quantum magnets. So uh, one thing I want to, to, to say here is that um, as we uh, go forward with this plan, which will not be completed and if, if, if successfully funded until 2032 or something like this, um, you know, we will generate massive amount of data and we will uh, uh, need theorists to be embedded in our teams in order to be able to analyze this data uh, from the get-go. And I think that's um, one thing I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really excited about in the future is to really try to connect as much as possible to theorists in order to be ready for, for this new generation neutron source that will, in some cases, uh, increase of sensitivity by factor 10 and of flux by factor 100. So we will be flooded with data and we will need to embrace, you know, the pioneering work in, in AI and in, in, in new ways to analyze the data. So we really need theorists to, uh, you know, to support this and to, to, to you know, to tell us uh, what to look for. For instance, we, we will have uh, uh, instruments that are fully polarized. So it means that we will be able to measure uh, this uh, dynamical susceptibility not only the diagonal part, but all the off-diagonal elements. And in some sense, we, uh, in many cases, we don't know what to expect in these in this channels. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to engaging with theorists on this and, and, and I'll be ready for, for when the machine is turned on that we can immediately have an impact on the, in this field. Um, and, and just the last word is that you, you've noticed that my fittings were done with essentially regression and, and, and chi-square fitting. And I think as, as the size of the data increases, we, we already at the limit of, of burning one graduate student per sample. And so we, 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 need, we need new techniques to analyze the data and to fit models and to predict and to, 
uh, to do this. And in fact, Kristen Batista and Alan Tennant have, have a paper where they use uh, some concept from AI to, uh, to fit uh, the frozen titanate data. So I think it's a promising direction. Of course, other theorists are much more advanced on this, particularly in the X-ray community. But, uh, but uh, that's the message I wanted to give to this audience of, of, uh, of at least some, some theorists that I, that I recognized. Uh, and with this, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, take your questions. Thank you, Martin, so much for your talk and your presentation. Um, and uh, well, uh, the session is open for questions. So I think Natasha has a question for you. Uh, thank you. So thanks a lot for a very, very nice talk. I have actually two questions. So the first question, you have this kind of quadruple, even mix uh, excitations, yes? that you're discussing. Right. So what would determine the lifetime or how you can extract the lifetime of this excitation from uh, your measurements? Yeah, so, you know, I, 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 I'm gonna have to plead the fifth here a little bit. So this is definitely where we are going. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, when we apply the magnetic field, it's pretty clear that uh, some of the decay conditions you might expect to happen, uh, this kinematic conditions in fact become fulfilled. So we are uh, in this uh, magnetic field measurements actually tracking for such effects. Uh, what we know is that in zero Tesla, which is the bulk of the data I showed here, as far as we can tell, the excitations are completely um, sharp. Um, in fact, the, uh, so uh, let me say this correctly. So the, there is very little quantum fluctuation in the system in zero field. Okay, so, so the moment is, is, is very well, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost the full moment. So, so we don't expect the kinematic conditions to be fulfilled for decays in zero Tesla. But as we approach uh, and as we change the magnetic field, we expect this to be the case. And uh, this is exactly what we are doing right now. And uh, I was asking more about uh, like zero Tesla because I would not uh, understand. Yes, so, so, so zero Tesla, we, we are quite convinced at this point that, uh, that the excitations are of infinite lifetime. I mean, as far as we are concerned with the real sample. So no intrinsic decay, no intrinsic decay. No intrinsic decay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the second question is basically, uh, since the Hamiltonian is so anisotropic, will you expect big anisotropy in the magnetic field response in this case? Yeah, so, I mean, so, so like in different so, directions, so uh, that probably. Yeah, so, so, so you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a uniaxial magnet. So, so in fact, we have to apply the field uh, along the Z direction, the C axis, uh, because uh, I mean, that's, that's the main direction of the anisotropy. If you look at the, if you magnetize in the other direction, the response is, is quite different. Now, there's one thing I, I want to say is that when we plug this JZ plus minus, which you see here is the dominant in interaction. In fact, what this does is that it tilts the plane of the ordering of the spins with respect to the triangular plane. And that tilting from our calculation should be 13 degrees. Now, people back in the days when they did the diffraction on these materials, they assigned the spin to be along the C axis. And uh, now we are, we're going to do some diffraction to see if indeed the spins are tilted certain degrees. This is really the effect of JZ plus minus. It's tilting the spin space with respect to the triangular plane. Uh, so this uh, we expect to be able to see in, in, in diffraction. Um, so so that's what I can say, in fact, is that the, the, the primary signature of the anisotropic interaction is the tilting of the spin plane with respect to the triangular plane. And, and, you know, 10 degrees uh, is sensitivity-wise with diffraction sometimes difficult, so I, it, it's kind of natural that people did not realize this, uh, and, but we are after it. Thank you. Yeah. See that Daniel has a question? Uh, Daniel, <laughs> unmute yourself, please go ahead. Okay, uh, my question is somehow related also to Natasha. Uh, when you are dealing with quadrupolar degrees of freedom, that's charge degrees of freedom, actually. So uh, they have to be very strongly coupled to phonons, generally speaking. Uh -huh. That's unquenched orbital moment. <clears throat> so you mentioned uranium O2, in which it's uh, mostly phonons which are important. But what about your system? In principle, it should be also uh, uh, rather important here. <clears throat> Do you yeah, see so any indication of that? Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a very <clears throat> good And uh, so what we can tell is that the phonons uh, are to higher energy than our magnons. And, and we, don't, you know, we don't see a direct coupling. There is no matching phonon at, at, at the energy of our magnetic excitations. And 
there are other materials in the same series of iron D halides. There is iron bromide and uh, iron uh, chloride and iron uh, fluoride. And in these materials that were studied by many groups in the 1980s, Jen Shirani and Bob Birchno and company, they, uh, I think in FeCl2, uh, the magnetic excitations are higher in energy and they couple directly to a phonon. And I think in that case, uh, there is a hybridization with the phonons that, that is, let's say, resonant because the, the, they have the same energy. In this material, we, we believe that the, um, although the coupling should be strong, the, it's a less uh, visible effect because the phonon, the, the energies that, the excitations are so low energy in the system, you see we are below four millivolts. We, we are kind of uh, approaching the dangerous zone or, or interesting zone, if you, depending on your point of view for phonons, but I think we are below uh, an energy where, where the coupling would be would be direct or, or more revealed, if, if that answers it. What is actually uh, the magnitude of your single site and isotropy as compared to exchange? Uh, because you gave uh, uh, two sets of uh, numbers, one table when you discussed optics, and then uh, your data uh, seems to be very different. What's effectively your D, your single site and isotropy, and your typical J? Typical J, I see it on the so the typical J is, is 0 0.2 millivolts and the mm -hmm. typical D is 2 millivolts. So it's a, it's and, uh, a 10 times. 10 times, yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. And, and I want to stress here that it's actually accidental that this energy scales matches, right? Because, I mean, at least that's our interpretation here, that had the exchange been different or the D been different, uh, these excitations would not overlap in zero field and we would not see a hybridization. Um, in principle, 10 millivolt already is close to phonon frequency. It should be already. Uh, 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 yeah, so, sorry, so, so two millivolt, two millivolt D. Ah, two, ah, sorry, point two and two. Ah, okay, sorry. Point two and two, yeah. Yeah, okay, got it, got it. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Good to see you. May I ask a question? Uh, yes, please That's go ahead. ahead. Hi, Martin, thanks for a nice talk. Um, so, um, Concerning this condensation of uh, Manglon pairs, uh, is this uh, similar to what uh, Zhitomirsky and Tsunetsugu considered for lithium copper vanadite in 2010? So, okay, there's two, two differences. Um, okay, maybe one is not a difference. Uh, I think it happens in neither materials. <laughs> but uh, the, let me, so, so you know, the Zhitomirsky's uh, work and uh, Tsunetsugu said they need to create the quadrupolar. Uh, object on a bond, okay? So the ferromagnetic bond between two spin cells that create this object, okay? And this is what condenses that high field. Um, here, the- Yeah, the, yeah but, but I'm asking just generally, you know, the, the, the interesting part of that work was that uh, your magnetic field and what condenses before in single magnets is magnet pairs. That's correct, that's correct. So it's similar here, right? It, it's in principle similar here, but the question is the following. Is the transition, let me go to that slide, and th that's what we're in investigating, and we are doing the experiment next week on CNCS. The, the question is the nature of that transition. You can imagine a second order transition where you condense a pair of, say, four magnets or two magnets, but you can also imagine a first order transition where you condense a microscopic number of magnets. And because the magnetic structure changes, in fact, what is likely to happen is that this, this is a condensation of a microscopic number of magnets. So you have the first order transition, another eigenstate is coming down and it has a completely different magnetic structure. So, so uh, at least for F1 and F2 phases, we believe that's what happened. It's a first order transition, microscopic thing is condensing. This F3 phase is unclear and the diffraction is not well understood from the 1980s. And this is actually where we are curious in, in, in in trying to understand if there is a condensation that is second order and where, where indeed we would have something that is similar to what uh, uh, Misha and, uh, and Sunesugu-san are talking about. But, but yeah. here- in, it's, in their case, it's a sort of both condensation type of, of, uh, of, of transition, right? So. Uh, yes, but that's a delta, that's a two spin trip that condenses. So, right, so right, but the, the, the point is that the magnon pairs Form a Bose condensate, right? So the question is the, the thing that you, the, what you have actually told me, if I understand it correctly, that in, in most cases or at low temperatures in this material, they do not, the transition is not of the type of Bose condensation of magnet pairs. Yeah, right? yeah I, guess, I guess that's the same thing I'm saying. Yeah, I, I agree with, with what you're saying. Okay, thanks.
all right. I don't see any hands. If you have a question, uh, a question, please raise, raise your hand or feel free to unmute yourself and ask. All right. I guess Martin, we're gonna have to invite you again to finish with the second part of your talk. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's okay. Uh, and and we need a bit of time to finish the paper. So that, that's it. <laughs> all right. You know. I, you know, this maybe is not, in the spring. You're always more ambitious. Uh, you're always more ambitious than uh, than you can actually deliver. But in that case, it's, as I said, I'm the bottleneck in, in all of this. And the Christian and, and, and uh, the folks from this side, they are absolutely fast and amazing. So it's been uh, it's been great to work with them. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Martin, for sharing uh, this very nice story with us. And um, thank you, everyone, for yep. joining us. Thank you. And um, uh, we'll see you again next week. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.